Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to tonight's uh, webinar where we're covering holding patterns uh, for the ASA and UK instrument rating. Uh, so there is quite a bit to talk about here with this one, so it's ended up being split into two parts. Uh, so we'll cover the first part tonight, uh, and then the second part we'll do uh, next week. So jumping into it then, a little bit about myself just to start with. Uh, this is really just to prove that I know what I'm on about. Uh, the reason I've come to doing this is that I spend quite a bit of my time instructing for uh, both EASA and UK instrument ratings and the UK uh, restricted instrument rating as well. And when people come to start these courses, we often find there's quite a bit of a gap between what people learn for, say, their ATPL exams or in their IRR ground school uh, compared to what they practically need to know when they go flying in the aircraft or when they turn up to start their training. Uh, so the idea with this uh, is to try to bridge that gap between uh, what people learn in the theoretical side of things and what they need to know when they turn up to go flying and start their training. Uh, so to go along with these webinars, I've also developed some online courses uh, that have the same purpose. So there's one uh, for the EASA and UK instrument rating, teaches you everything you need to know before you start your flight training for those. Uh, and then we've also got an online course for the UK only uh, restricted instrument rating or the IMC rating as it gets called as well. Um, and that teaches you everything that you need to know for both the theory exam plus that small exam and also the flight training as well. Uh, but that's enough about me. So let's jump into our topic for tonight. So holding patterns for the EASA and UK instrument rating. So we'll start by talking about uh, the general structure of the hold We'll talk about both standard holds and non-standard holds. Uh, then we'll talk about what we do about the wind in the hold, what we do about crosswinds, headwinds, tailwinds, how we correct for all those in a hold. And then lastly tonight we'll talk about if we do happen to get out of position in the hold, uh, if we're not where we're supposed to be, firstly how do we recognize that and secondly how do we correct for it. And for those of you that are here uh, because you're going into an instrument rating course, uh, a few suggestions for you to start with. I'd say don't just sit and listen to what I've got to say, uh, because I will be throwing quite a bit of information at you in a fairly short space of time uh, while we go through this for the next 30 uh, to 45 minutes or so. So I'd suggest that you take some notes as you go through, uh, and then when you're coming up to each of these stages uh, for your instrument rating training, review the notes that you've got, and you'll be well ahead of the average student. And if anybody has any questions as I go through any of this, um, feel free to jump on YouTube's live chat uh, feature and I'll answer the questions as we go. So, uh, chapter one for tonight then, starting with the structure of the hold. Uh, before we do talk about the hold itself though, I'll just cover this instrument here that we're going to be using quite a bit. Uh, so on the instrument there, we've got uh, the heading at the top. So in this case, the heading is 360 degrees, which is the same direction that aeroplane there on the right is flying. And then we've got a bearing pointer there, uh, which in this case is tuned to that NDB frequency there. So the bearing pointer will just point straight at whatever it is set to, in this case, an NDB. And lastly, we've got a heading bug, and we're going to use that to uh, indicate the heading that we intend to fly. So looking at that instrument on the left there, in this case, that would be an aircraft that's currently on a heading of 360 degrees, that it's in a turn, making a right-hand turn onto a heading of 090 degrees. Uh, so the holding pattern then, uh, just covering the basics to start with. So the holding pattern is this racetrack shaped pattern that we fly that's centered around some kind of holding fix. The holding fix itself can be pretty much any point that we can define. Uh, so it can be any radio nav aid, or it could be a GNSS waypoint as well. So the most common ones you'll see, we've got NDB holds, uh, we've got VOR holds, there's GNSS holds, which are based on just a GPS waypoint, or some combination of those where we end up flying a hold, say on a distance uh, from a VOR and also a, like a radial from the same VOR. Uh, but these days, with the modern technology that we've got, we can define any point that we like, really, and any point in space we can make up, and we could fly a hold around that point. 
so the hold then is split into four separate parts are centered around the holding fix. So the first leg that we've got is the inbound track. That's the inbound track that we have to fly to the holding fix. So in this example here, uh, we've got an inbound track of 270 degrees. Uh, so we need to be tracking west as we're flying towards the holding fix. So this is what we would call an east-west hold. As you're flying that inbound track, your instrument should look something like this. And now this is assuming that there is no wind. Uh, we'll talk about the wind a bit later. So to start with, we'll assume that there's no wind. So we've got an inbound track of 270 degrees. Your instrument should look like that. We're flying a heading of 270 degrees and your bearing pointer is also showing 270, which is what tells you that you're tracking along the correct track to the holding fix. If you reach the holding fix, uh, you're gonna start a right-hand turn and that's what we call the outbound turn. So you're gonna fly a rate one outbound, oh, rate one level turn uh, onto the outbound leg. So at the end of this outbound turn, we should be at what we call the abeam position. So where this diagram, this aeroplane is now, you've just finished your outbound turn. You've just rolled wings level. If there's no wind and you've flown the turn perfectly, you would be at what we call the abeam position. So this is where you're 90 degrees across the hold. And that's indicated by that bearing pointer there is showing 90 degrees to both the inbound and the outbound track. So in this case, on your instrument there, you know you're at the abeam position when the bearing pointer is uh, sat there on 180 degrees pointing south. The next leg we're gonna fly that you can see there is the outbound leg. Uh, but to know how long the outbound leg is going to be, uh, we use our stopwatch. So we fly it for a time of one minute. We need to know where to start our timing. So Ikea tell us that we always have to start our outbound timing either uh, at this abeam position or when we roll wings level, whichever comes later. Uh, so sometimes you would reach the abeam position first, sometimes you'll roll wings level first. It all depends on how well you've flown this outbound turn and it depends on what the wind's doing on the day. Uh, but we're always gonna start the timer at the abeam position or wings level, whichever comes later. From there, we'll fly the outbound leg. So in this case, it's an outbound track of zero, nine, zero degrees. So it's the reciprocal of what the inbound track was. And in a standard hold, we'll fly this outbound leg for one minute. At the end of the one minute, your instrument should look something like that, where the bearing pointer is pointing back over your right shoulder and you've reached your timing of one minute. So you're ready to start the next. Turn. The next turn that you'll fly is the inbound turn. So again, this is a rate one level turn. And if you've flown it all perfectly, uh, which most of us don't do, but if you have flown it all perfectly, you should finish this inbound turn uh, nicely back on the inbound track. And you'd fly once again, the inbound track of 270 degrees back to the holding fix. So we've got these four legs of the hold centered around the holding fix. And while you're flying all of those, uh, ultimately, you're judged on three things. Well, there's three things that you need to achieve. And when we're talking about uh, instrument rating tests, these are the three things in the hold that you're going to get judged on. Uh, the first one is your track inbound to the beacon. So in this case, inbound track of 270 degrees, you need to be on that inbound track. If you're not on that inbound track, you need to be correcting and getting yourself on it. Uh, that is ultimately probably the biggest thing that you're judged on in the test. And if you're not on the inbound track, then you're not properly positioned in the hold, which depending on how poorly you are positioned, could then bring into question whether you're still terrain safe. Uh, secondly, the next thing that you're gonna be judged on in the hold is your timing. Uh, so we said in a standard hold, it's one minute outbound. Uh, we do change the timing a little bit, depending on the wind, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, but if you don't get the timing correct, so say you're supposed to be flying an outbound time of one minute, that you end up flying it for a minute 30 or two minutes or three minutes or four minutes or whatever it happens to be, you're making this hold bigger and bigger and bigger as your timing gets longer and longer, which again might then stretch your hold to be so big that you put yourself into a position where the aircraft is no longer terrain safe. And then lastly, while you're doing all of that, uh, you're judged on your altitude. So most of the time you're going to be flying level throughout the hold. You might get clearances to where you need to climb or descend in the hold, but most of the time you'll be flying level. 
And there might be another airplane above you in the hole. There might be another one below you. So you need to be maintaining your altitude while you're flying around this hole. Okay. Uh, so that's the structure of a standard hold, uh, but not all holds are standard. We do have standard holds and non-standard holds. So in a standard hold, as we've just looked at, we've got these four legs. Each one's one minute long. And we've got the beam position there, giving us a four minute standard hold. Uh, they're only four minutes if you fly them below flight level 140, uh, but most of you will probably be staying below flight level 140, so we'll stick to the four minute hold for tonight. Uh, a standard hold always has right hand turns. Uh, the turns are always made at rate one. As we've said, you're going to need to start your timer at the beam position or wings level, whichever comes later. And as I've just covered, you're judged on those three things while you're flying the hold. Not all st holds are standard holds, though. We do get non-standard holds as well. Uh, so non-standard holds can uh, be left-hand holds, where you make the turns to the left instead of the right. Uh, they can have different timings, so a hold might be defined as you need to fly outbound for 1 minute 30 or 2 minutes. Uh, or, alternatively, we do get lots of holds these days, particularly with GPS holds where uh, you don't fly outbound for one minute. In fact, you don't use the timing at all, and you fly outbound until you reach a certain DME distance or until you reach some other GNS, uh, some other GPS waypoint, and then you start the inbound turn. Uh, the majority of the holes that you fly will be standard holes, though. Uh, the most common non-standard holes that you come across uh, are simply left-hand holes, but everything else stays the same. Uh, but whenever there's differences, there, it's always quite clearly marked on your so moving on to the wind in the hold so everything we've talked about so far uh, is just if there if you're flying around with no wind how would you fly the hold uh, but obviously we all know that never happens so there's going to be days where there's crosswinds in the hold days where there's headwinds days where there's tailwinds so we need some method of correcting for the wind uh, to keep ourselves in the right position which keeps us safe while we're flying the hold so there are two corrections that you need to make uh, for wind in the hold the first one is a heading correction so we're going to change our heading uh, to compensate for any left or right drift from, uh, and that'll be a result of any crosswind that happens to exist in the hold and the second correction is a time correction so if there's any headwind or tailwind uh, when we're flying the outbound leg we're going to adjust that one minute outbound timing slightly so we'll talk about heading corrections first so why do we need to make the heading corrections so using the same hold as an example if there were a northerly wind and we made no changes to our heading we flew it the same way we talked about a moment ago uh, your outbound turn would be uh, squashed a little bit like this because you're turning into a headwind so the turn radius would be slightly smaller if you didn't correct for the wind on the outbound leg, you would get drifted to the south. And then lastly, as you flew your inbound turn, uh, you'd have a tailwind. The turn would be much bigger and you'd end up south of the hole like this. So what do we do about it? Well, the solution is that we change the heading that we're flying on the outbound leg. Uh, we can't do much about the wind while we're flying the two turns because we're simply flying a rate one turn. Now, yes, we could argue that you could fly less than a rate one turn to make one uh, the turn at one end slightly bigger. But then that brings into question how uh, how much less of a rate one turn do we need to make, and it all become a little bit in inaccurate. And then when we're instrument flying, we shouldn't fly any more than a rate one turn. So the hold at the far end in this example, the inbound turn, uh, we couldn't do anything about that one. We'd still be flying a rate one turn, and we'd still make quite a big uh, radius of turn there. So the simplest solution is that we change our heading on the outbound leg. So on the outbound leg, we need to correct four. We've got a one minute rate one turn outbound. Then we've got one minute flying the outbound leg. And then we have one minute flying the rate one turn inbound. So the wind is affecting us for a total of three minutes. So the wind will cause you to drift for three minutes throughout these three legs of the hold. However, we've just said it's pretty much impossible to correct during the two turns because all you can do is fly a rate one turn. Therefore, the correct for the three minutes 
we triple the wind correction on the outbound leg. So the one minute that we fly the outbound leg for, we make triple the correction, and that will compensate for all of these three minutes in which the wind is affecting us. So ultimately, what we're going to do is on the outbound leg, we're going to apply three times the drift. So how do we do that in detail then? So to calculate your outbound heading, firstly, we need to know what our maximum drift is. So we calculate our maximum drift. Formula for that there is 60 times the wind speed divided by your true airspeed. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with the maximum drift concept from your PPL. Um, this is a concept that essentially just says that if the wind was at 90 degrees to our heading, uh, therefore we would drift the most that we could possibly drift in this wind. But how many degrees would we drift by? That's the maximum drift. Uh, but the wind won't always be at 90 degrees to our heading. It might be just slightly off our nose, in which case there wouldn't be much crosswind. So next we calculate the heading between the outbound track and the wind. Once we've got the difference between where our nose is pointed, what our heading is, uh, and the wind, we can use the clock code to determine, uh, to determine how much drift we're actually going to experience on this outbound leg. Now that we know how much we're going to drift uh, on the outbound leg, so we know what our drift is, we're going to triple that, uh, and that's how much we're going to change our heading by. So our, our heading correction on the outbound leg is always going to be three times the drift. Um, now I know there's a few steps in there and this takes a little bit to get your head around and to work it out and every hole will be slightly different. And you're not going to need to do the calculation in this much detail while you're flying. Uh, this is all to prepare yourself on the ground so that you can, you've got a solid plan that you can take into the air with you. Now, we will go through some examples and once you've gone through a few examples of how this works, it all becomes um, much more straightforward. It all starts to make a lot more sense. And the more and more you practice it, the easier and easier it gets and the better and better you get at uh, working this out. Uh, but before we go through that, we've got our second correction that we need to make. So that's how we correct for the heading. How are we going to correct, uh, or how are we going to change the time to correct for any headwind or tailwind that we happen to have? So using the same hold as an example, if we had an easterly wind this time, uh, we reach the holding fix, we start our outbound turn, the aircraft's going to get drifted to the east, ah, sorry, the aircraft's going to get drifted to the west throughout this whole turn. So we're going to be shifted, in this case, slightly to the left of the hold. We then start flying the outbound leg for one minute, but we're flying it into a headwind. If we still only fly it for one minute, we're not going to cover as much ground. Then at the end of the one minute, uh, we start the inbound turn, again, getting drifted to the west throughout the whole turn. And by the time we finish this turn, because we've still only flown outbound for one minute, we were almost already back at the holding fix. So essentially what we've done here is we've almost just flown an orbit over the top of the holding fix. So the solution here is to fly out down for more than one minute so that we end up in a better position within the hole. So now the question is, how much are we going to change the outbound timing by? Uh, so to calculate your outbound time, first we need to know what the headwind or the tailwind is. So we're going to calculate the headwind or tailwind outbound. And then quite simply, we're going to take our outbound time of one minute and we're going to either add or subtract one second for each knot of headwind or tailwind. So in that example that we just looked at, we had a headwind on the outbound leg, therefore we're going to fly the outbound leg for more than one minute. So if it was a 20 knot headwind outbound, we would fly the outbound leg for one minute and 20 seconds. If we had a tailwind, we're going to need to fly the outbound leg for less than one minute. So if we had a 20 knot tailwind on the outbound leg, we would fly the outbound for 40 seconds. So there's a few calculations to make there. And the whole point of this, as I've said, is to figure out roughly what you're going to want to do when you get to the hold. But you're going to figure all this out beforehand on the ground. Um, so we're going to go through those steps uh, and you can work out exactly what you think you're going to need to do in the air. And then you can adjust it slightly uh, depending on what the wind is doing as you're arriving into the hold. 
as I say, we will get going through some examples, uh, but we've got a few more points in the hole to talk about and uh, one or two small calculations to make before we get into any examples. So the last step uh, for tonight, for part one of this then, is uh, let's say you've made all those calculations on the ground, but when you get to the hold in the air, uh, the wind isn't quite what it was forecast, so you fly everything perfectly as you planned on the ground, but you still end up a little bit out of position. What do we do about it? So in other words, once we're airborne, what do we do when the hold goes wrong? Uh, to know that the hole's gone wrong, we need some way of recognizing what our position within the hold is uh, and then methods of correcting it. So the corrections that we can make in the hold uh, or the points, there's two points that we can use in the hold to assess our position and correct if required. So the first point that we're going to use to assess our position is known as the gate and the second one is known as the 60 degree to go point. So starting with the gate then. The gate is this line here, this orange line here across the hold. So that we define the gate as a line that's 30 degrees offset from both the inbound and the outbound tracks uh, straight across the hold there. If you were to fly your hold perfectly, then when you get to the end of your outbound timing, you should also be reaching this gate at the same time. So if there were no wind, in theory, when your timer gets to one minute, your instrument should look something like that, where we know for this hold, uh, the outbound track is 090, so 30 degrees left of that is 060, therefore the gate in this hold is 060 degrees. As our timer reaches one minute, our bearing pointer should be rotating around and the tail of it should be reaching 060 degrees. That's the ideal situation, but that's not always going to happen. So let's say, just like this aeroplane here, you make your outbound turn, you start flying outbound, and you find yourself reaching the gate before you reach the timer. All right? and we can see from this diagram, if you did nothing about it, if you carried on outbound on the same heading, you'd make your inbound turn and you'd end up south of the hole. So we want some way of correcting that before we get there so that we don't overshoot the inbound track. So but the scenario is you're flying your outbound leg, and that bearing pointer gets to the gate, in this case 060 degrees, before you reach your one minute outbound timing. We can simply turn left and fly outbound along the gate. So we can say if you reach the gate before you reach your outbound time, you're going to turn and fly outbound along the gate. You'll carry on flying outbound along the gate until you reach your original timing, so one minute in this case, uh, and you're going to make your normal inbound turn from there. And if everything worked out perfectly, you've fixed your position in the hold and you've got yourself nicely onto the inbound track at the end of the turn. So what would that look like in the cockpit then? So in this first position, you're flying outbound and you get this indication where the bearing pointer is showing 060 degrees before you've reached your outbound timing. So we're gonna make a left turn you can see there on the second instrument, we've turned left onto 060 degrees and now we're flying directly away from the holding fix out along the gate. We carry on on this new heading until we reach the outbound time. And then we make the normal inbound turn and hopefully finish that turn on the inbound leg. Uh, so that's the idea of the gate is that if you're inside the hold, uh, you can make this small turn, correct your position nicely before you start the inbound turn and you can get yourself up onto the gate. The second point in the hold that we use uh, to correct or to assess our position and correct if we need to uh, is this point here, which is known as the 60 degree to go point. Uh, it's called the 60 degrees to go point because you have 60 degrees of your turn left to make uh, to get yourself onto the inbound track. So just like this scenario here, we've got an aircraft that is on a heading of 210 degrees. We're saying that the inbound track is to 70 degrees, so you're 60 degrees before that inbound track. You've got 60 degrees of your turn left to make. At that point, if you're in the correct position in the hold, you should be 10 degrees before your inbound track. So in this case, our heading is 210 degrees. We should 
uh, have a bearing pointer showing 10 degrees before the inbound track, so it should be showing to 6 and 0 degrees. So there's a picture there. This is the ideal situation. We're making that inbound turn. We're turning through to 1, 0 degrees, and you can see the bearing pointer there is 10 degrees before our uh, inbound track of 2, 7, 0. So the bearing pointer is on 2, 6, 0. That's ideal. So at this point, our target is to have the bearing pointer on uh, 2, 6, 0 degrees. But of course, once again, that won't always happen for every hold that you fly. So the first scenario uh, is that you are uh, inside the hold like this. So in this case, we're too far to the north. The scenario being you've started your turn inbound, uh, but you get to your heading to 1, 0 degrees uh, before the bearing pointer has gotten uh, into the correct position. So in this case, the bearing uh, to the holding fix is more than 10 degrees before the inbound track. That tells you you're inside the hold. So looking at the instrument there on the left, uh, you're turning through, again, a heading of 210 degrees. You've got 60 degrees of heading change left to make. 60 degrees of your turn left to go, so that's why it's called the 60 degrees to go point. But the bearing pointer is 20 degrees before the inbound track. Uh, so now the bearing pointer is before our target. So the solution here, uh, as we can see from this overview, is that you should roll wings level at this point and intercept the inbound track. So you need to fly straight to get yourself closer to the inbound track and then finish your turn on the 270 degrees. The easiest way to remember this, I find, is uh, the target for the 60 degrees to go point. The target is to have the bearing pointer 10 degrees before the inbound track. If you're before that target, you need to roll wings level before the bearing pointer. The alternative then uh, is if we're outside the hold. <clears throat> so this is the other scenario. Uh, we can see again from this instrument here, we've started the inbound turn. We're passing uh, to one zero degrees, which is 60 degrees to go. But the bearing pointer has already overshot our target. Uh, so the bearing point is already passed. The target is past the inbound track in this case, so we need to keep turning the aeroplane. We need to get the nose of the aircraft past the bearing pointer, re-intercept the inbound track from the other side. So you should continue turning past the bearing pointer and uh, get that bearing pointer back onto 270 degrees. So putting the three together then, we can see the middle image there, that's what you want it to look like. As you're making this turn, that's exactly what you want it to look like. You've got the bearing point at 10 degrees before the inbound track. If you're inside the hold, we've got the situation with the image on the right there, where the bearing pointer is before your target, so you need to roll wings level before the bearing pointer. In other words, you need to roll wings level now. And then on the far left image, we've got the other one where the bearing point has already overshot the target. So we need to turn past the bearing pointer, push the head of that bearing pointer back onto 270 degrees. So all of that gives us lots and lots of mental uh, work to do uh, before we get into the air to fly a hold. Um, I do always say that uh, there is, um, there's more mentally, mental calculations. Of, the holds are the most mentally challenging part of an instrument rating, really. There's other aspects of the instrument rating that are easier to hand fly uh, because a hold, ultimately, all you're doing is flying straight and level and flying level turns. But there's a lot more mental work going on in the background before holds. Uh, I'll just go back a slide just to answer uh, one person's question there. So someone's asked, does the 60 degree to go point include the effect of NDB dip? Uh, so in this case, this example that we're using, no, it doesn't, uh, because this bearing pointer could be set up to anything. So we're not specifically talking about an NDB hold here. Um, it could be a VOR hold but using a bearing pointer, it could be a GNSS hold. And if you are flying an NDB hold and you're using uh, you know, raw data NDB needle, then yes, you will need to think about NDB dip. Um, so NDB dip being any time your, your aircraft is banked, that bearing point will move and it won't be accurate. Uh, that becomes aircraft specific because from one aircraft to the next, the amount of dip changes. 
So something like a Seneca uh, or a PA28 usually has about 10 degrees of dip, whereas DA42s tend to have anywhere from sort of 30 to 50 degrees of dip. It depends exactly what you're flying. Um, so we can't really cover the details of NDB dip for everybody here. Um, but yeah, you're entirely right. If you are flying an NDB hold while you're making this turn, you'd need to account for NDB dip error as well. Good stuff. Uh, so we've talked about lots of different calculations to make. Um, lots of different points around the hold. So we've got from starting from the holding fix, we're going to reach the abeam position first, roughly at the end of the outbound turn, we'll be at the abeam position. Then we're going to fly the outbound leg. There will be an outbound track published for the hold. We've already talked about how we're going to uh, calculate a heading and calculate a time to fly outbound. Then as we carry on outbound, we should hopefully, in an ideal world, you would reach the gate and uh, you'd reach the gate and your outbound timing at the same time. But we can calculate on the ground, we can calculate a direction for the gate so we know what we're looking for when we get in the air. Next, we can calculate what heading we're going to be at uh, when we're at the 60 degree to go point. So we can have a reminder of that. And then lastly, we've got an inbound track. And we can calculate an inbound heading that we're going to fly back to the holding fix. Uh, so a diagram like this can be very useful uh, for instrument pre-flight planning, um, especially at first when you're just getting into learning how to fly holds. Um, filling out a diagram like this, giving yourself lots of different holds, giving yourself lots of different wind conditions to plan for and think about, um, you can come up and, with a diagram like this. Uh, we've got one on our website that you can uh, download for free. I've got the link to it in the description on YouTube for this video. Um, this gives you both left hand hold, right hand holds, and it's just a fill in the blank diagram that's quite useful. Um, so that's all the theory behind a hold, really. That's what we're going to plan, uh, how we're going to plan everything on the ground. It's all the things you're going to think about on the ground before you get flying. Um, that's, I think that's all we're going to cover for tonight. Uh, and next week we'll jump into part two of this um, and we'll look at lots and lots of examples. Uh, we'll go through a few examples, calculating all these different points around the hold, exactly how we do it. Uh, and then we'll also have hold entries to talk about as well. Uh, so there we are. We've got uh, part two of holding patterns for both the ASA and UK pilots. So we'll do it next week. Uh, we've got the 27th of February. Uh, 1930 European time or uh, 1830 UK time. Uh, so there we'll cover, yeah, lots of examples and the hold entries. Um, to answer one other person's question, uh, yes, uh, YouTube automatically puts this video online once we're done. So you'll be able to go to our YouTube channel uh, and access this video. Uh, and watch it again at any point. Um, same with one that we did a few weeks ago and same with the one that we're going to do next week. Um, so for those of you that did come along and watch it live, thank you very much. Um, if anybody does have any questions or anything that they think of that pops up, feel free to send me an email, uh, info at clearflight.co.uk. I'll do my best to answer all your questions. Um, and uh, you can also have a look at our website if you like. Uh, I might just bring it up here quickly. Uh, we've got lots of free resources uh, that we can have a look at. So on the website, if we go to uh, have a look at the free stuff. Um, you can have a look through the website. You might uh, find some other bits and pieces that are useful. Uh, yeah, if we go to manuals and documents, there's the whole planner that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so blank diagram that you can print out, you can fill in uh, for each of the holes that you're planning on flying in your uh, training. And uh, right, that's everything for tonight. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming along. And, and hopefully I'll see most of you next week as well.